year of your country, and I had the honor to meet you in Almaty, Almaty and uh, we could only dream of what you would accomplish. In fact, we couldn't dream of it. Uh, the whole question of this country and what it could be was, uh, of course, uh, unknown, but you had a vision of what could be done, and it's really inspiring not only to come back, but to come to this new city and see its incredible dynamism and growth, and also to listen to you and your vision for the coming generation. It's really wonderful. And thank you also for bringing amazing people here. If I may, although there are many amazing people, I just want to name three uh, that are very special for me. One is Romano Prodi, uh, because he is been a great leader for Europe and for the idea of integration and peace. Second is uh, President Kozniewski because he was one of the, is one of the greatest political leaders of the transition period. And when I had the honor to advise Poland, I got to know him as a great, great president and we all admire you tremendously. And there are many of my colleagues here but I want to say a word about Tom Sargent just for one moment. I don't think he, he knows it, but I want to say thank you to you. Because 31 years ago, I got started in practical policy advising. And I was asked to go to Bolivia to help end a hyperinflation. And I carried in my pocket an article of yours, the end of four high inflations. And I went and I showed the president, you see it ends in one day, it's okay. Uh, based on your work, and indeed the, the uh, Bolivian hyperinflation ended in one day. And I haven't had a chance to properly thank you, but that's a heck of a good paper. Uh, and of course, uh, it was one of the things that got you a Nobel Prize, so uh, it's really wonderful, wonderful to see you. We've heard a lot about the major trends right now, and uh, I don't need uh, any of that, uh, by the way. Uh, we don't need to uh, show anything. Um, we've heard a lot about the major trends. And I just want to put in context what, what this means for Kazakhstan. Two huge trends, obviously. One is technology, and the second is China. And you had the good judgment to bring the face of China and technology here because nobody represents that more than Jack Ma. But of course, uh, that's complete world changing. Uh, the period in which uh, the North Atlantic dominated the world has ended. China now, according to some data, which I credit, is now already the world's largest economy. And we know that the growth of Asia and Eurasia will continue to be dominant in the coming generation. And Eurasia is going to assume what it always uh, has assumed for most of human history as the center of the global economy. And I'm so glad that everybody has picked up on the uniqueness of the Silk Road. Uh, this was the superhighway for 2,000 years passing through this neighborhood. And it's going to be the superhighway again when we have two uh, giant economic powers, a, an East Asian uh, conglomerate of China, Japan, and Korea, which is already by far the world's largest single integrated economic entity, and the European space. Uh, and Central Asia, once again, uh, this time, not on horseback, uh, but uh, as you say, on e-back, uh, on uh, uh, fast uh, everything, uh, will again be a great connector. Those are two profound trends. A third one and fourth are much more difficult, and I want to highlight them. If we're stupid, and humanity has that possibility, by the way, because remember, we're not robots. We do forget. We do all sorts of stupid things. 
There are two big things that we could do absolutely disastrously. One is to wreck the physical Earth, because we're far along on that path of ruining the climate and ruining and poisoning a lot of the inhabited planet. And the data really are dangerous, because we're already setting every record in terms of the warming of the planet. Last year was the hottest year on instrument record since instrumentation began systematically in 1879. Every month this year has been the warmest month on instrument record, breaking record after record, in part because of El Nino, but more fundamentally because of the long-term trends. And so this issue that all countries agreed on last December to decarbonize the world energy system is absolutely of fundamental importance for the world. We may think we don't have to do it or it's a choice. We may end up not doing it because we're stupid, but we have to do it if we want to save the planet. And already this region, which is water stressed all the time, mm -hmm. is suffering profound droughts, greater water insecurity, and all of the aspects that further global warming can bring. That's stupidity number one that's possible. We have to get off the current path and onto a new one. We've lost a generation doing that because it was also 24 years ago when we signed the climate treaty, but we didn't implement it for the first 24 years. So it's only now that we're actually starting seriously to think about implementation. This is a big deal for this country because you're a hydrocarbon economy. But fortunately also, Kazakhstan has massive renewable energy potential, massive sunshine, which we are enjoying every day, and massive wind potential, and other energy sources. So that's good news. But it's going to be a major effort. And the second stupidity, of course, is the stupidity of each of us vis-a-vis -vis someone else, other groups, because we have a horrible tendency to create or prolong conflicts that can go on for generations. And of course, no one can forget that it's a hundred years anniversary of World War I, which was absolutely the war of most destruction with no reason in the world because historians can't even figure out why it happened except that everybody said why don't we have a little war and we're a hundred years later still trying to overcome that disastrous war and by the way this is the hundredth anniversary this week of the Sykes-Picot Treaty which shows what happens when you have imperial powers trying to divide up the world and they make a mess that lasts for a century and we're still at war because of that stupid line that was drawn 100 years ago secretly by two diplomats of imperial powers. So these are our challenges. How to take advantage of this great economic opportunity, this wonderful technological possibility and at the same time, not destroy the planet and not destroy each other. It's quite an agenda. It really is, as you said, Mr. President, an incredible crossroads. I just want to end by a few practical suggestions. And your speech was so wonderful. I'm writing an article just this week exactly on your proposal. I'll cite you, but uh, we were thinking uh, along the same lines, and I'm very excited. You know, a healthy, educated population is absolutely the critical point for being able to take advantage in the positive way of all that we have. Jack is probably right, we'll never be as smart as the computers, but if we're uneducated, we're not even going to come close. And so a healthy, educated population is absolutely at the center of the global agenda to make sure that every child in this planet has a chance. 
But in poor countries, it's not the case right now. And for hundreds of millions of kids, it's definitely not the case. We still have about six million kids dying every year under the age of five for absolutely insanely stupid reasons. Now, it used to be 13 million. Now it's down to six. But six million deaths for no reason other than poverty is a tragedy and a threat to everybody. And as Mr. President said, we have hundreds of millions of kids who do not have a practical opportunity to complete even high school. And what uh, Jack is doing and what Alibaba is doing, for example, in China, is using online to bring education to remote villages so that we could do this for millions and millions of kids around the world. And your proposal, Mr. President, that we need global organization to do this is exactly correct. We need some funding to make it possible to unleash this at a massive scale. I helped 15 years ago to design something called the Global, uh, 15 years ago, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. That has helped make great advance against those three diseases, but we need what you propose, a global health fund more generally so that everybody has access to basic health services. And we don't yet even have a global fund for education, as you propose. And what's interesting for me is these are not only wonderful proposals, but I was scratching my head as I was writing my monthly column this morning. How are we really going to pay for this? Because my country, the United States, for example, is very stingy, really stingy because it spends $900 billion a year on the military, but only $30 billion a year on development aid. So we've got everything wrong. And the rich people in my country don't like to pay taxes, so they keep all their money in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> and the politicians let them do it so that the rich people pay the politicians to fund their election campaigns. answer you gave just now. Of course, we need a tax on the offshore havens, on the accounts there. It doesn't have to be a big tax. $30 trillion on deposit. You said 1%. That's $300 billion a year. We would end poverty. We would end illiteracy. We would end these deaths of children. No problem. I'd settle even for 0.2 of 1%. Because $60 billion could get us a health fund and an education fund. So, Mr. President, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful suggestion. I am your servant to carry it out. I'm going to carry it out. A third suggestion, and you would get made it, so you gave my talk, so I'm only repeating. We need a roadmap of how to make the low carbon green economy. And I just want to mention that at the next climate meeting, COP22, my part of the UN will be co-hosting with the host government, which is Morocco this year, a conference, not of diplomats this time, but of engineers. So we're going to have engineers and experts from 196 countries. We count on Kazakhstan being well represented. The invitations are just coming out. So that we can talk about practical technology pathways to the low carbon economy. Because the diplomats have done their job now. They've produced a universal treaty. But now we have to implement it. And for that, we need Jack and we need the e-economy and we need the engineers to show the technical roadmaps of what can be done. Finally, I want to end with how we're going to take some step towards not blowing each other up. And you know, this period, I remember 25 years ago because I was uh, for the, the foreign advisor head for President Yeltsin and even before that for President Gorbachev. And the idea then was absolutely clear. 
that it was going to be from the Atlantic to the Pacific, a unified Eurasian, peaceful, economically integrated region of the world. And yet we're now almost back into a cold war, even a hot war. And this is extraordinarily dangerous and misguided. There are many aspects to it, but one of the aspects, unfortunately, is that when the Cold War ended, President Gorbachev was promised that NATO would stay where it is, because why would we need NATO when the Soviet Union's not even there anymore? And I think it's really important for NATO to tell the rest of the world we stop. We're not aiming to go to the Ukraine border, into Ukraine, to the Russian border, or elsewhere, because we have to say we need to get back to the vision of a unified, peaceful, integrated Eurasia. And to my mind, this is absolutely essential. And your voice, as a great voice of peace and integration, is extraordinarily important in this. But it's a very dangerous moment, and we have to pull back from this danger. And finally, I want to say one, one more thing. This region is, for all of us, a beloved and historic region. And you produce many, many great things of culture and of exchange. For me, I have one favorite that I want to mention. Uh, my favorite philosopher in the world is Aristotle. So I consider myself a, an Aristotelian. Now, the greatest philosopher that transmitted Aristotle from the ancient world to the modern world is, of course, Al-Farabi. And your philosopher born here in this region is the one that brought Aristotle improved, integrated with Islamic thought, and transmitted to Europe and to the world. And we need from you more Al-Farabis. We need the wisdom, the vision, the moral leadership, and we know we can count on it. Thank you very much.